Consciousness is a dream that I pursue. Comme les jambes à l'œil fauve, je vendrai dans ton accord. Et vers toi glisserai sans bruit avec les hommes de la nuit. He fumbles at your spirit as players at the keys. Before they drop full music on, he stuns you by your voice. Sante sang with a diwan, tros and kissia. Fakilas descansu sore. Noctes at quid dies patid at tu yandis. Said rewakare grano super. Fathom five, thy father lies. Of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him. Come, sealing night. Scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day. Light thickens and the crow makes wing to the rookie wood. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse, whilst night's black agents to their praise do rouse. Thou marvelst at my words. But hold me still. This is Twilight on the Western Door. Sator, Aripo, Tenet, Opera, Rotas. Consciousness is a dream. This is Mason Winfield, the host of Twilight on the Western Door, a program of discussions and interviews with world class experts who take us from the roots of the paranormal to the cutting edge of understanding. The title of our program tonight is Talking to the Dead, Portrait of a Religious Revolution. Our guest is Ron Nagy, the historian of the Lilydale Assembly in Casadega, New York. Ron, are you there? I am here with you. Fantastic. Ron, um, I think probably the first question to ask you is, what is your title at Lilydale, and uh, what do you do there? I'm the historian here and the museum curator. I do walking tours. And That's fine. I'm um, a ghost, ghost walk commentator. Generally do everything that has to do with history. That's fantastic. Well, you know, the first question people ask about spiritualism, I mean, as, as uh, many people know, there's, there's really two uses of the word. One is with a small s, and one is with the capital. Would you be willing to uh, tell us what the difference is, or what's the definition of spiritualism with a big S? The big S is a person who believes as the basis of her religion in the continuity of life and an individual responsibility. You have to remember, all spiritists aren't mediums or healers. And spiritists, what they do is they endeavor to find the truth in all things and to live their lives accordingly, like the golden rule. Well, that's beautiful. Um, maybe we should have a few more spiritualists in the world. You know, I've been told that the spiritualism of a small s is sort of an attitude about the world, which believes that, you know, spirits can exist and that they can be active. And spiritualism with a capital S is probably the religion. Uh, would, would you agree with that? Yes. Okay, very cool. Now, did spiritualism start as a sort of a a spin-off of Christianity. In its, in its early years, was it also Christian? No. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Spiritualism started as a separation from Christianity. All right. Um, would you like to go over, you know, in some of my talks and tours, I, I talk a little bit about spiritualism. And, uh, you know, we have a tour of East Aurora. There's a spiritualist church here. And before we pass it, I always take a little time out and, and, and talk a bit about spiritualism. And I usually uh, describe the, the, the world climate in the West in the mid-1800s 
which honestly, um, a lot of people would think of the world as progressively less uh, supernatural, less uh, superstitious as time goes on. I'm not completely positive that's always true, because if you look at the academic climate in the mid-1800s, you know, the, the attitude in the colleges, I think they may be more open-minded now, because scientism, you know, the Enlightenment, this concept had hit, and it was so stuck in the mind of most of the academics, it's, it's really hard for us to realize how much... Um, Subjects like a belief in spirits or ghosts or witchcraft, magic, paganism. It's, it's hard to believe how little credence that would have. But, but supernaturalism was always beating beneath the surface. And in March of 1848, there's a little town called Hydesville. It is in upstate New York. It's about 20 miles, I would say, give or take, east of Rochester. It's... Um, uh, and in March 1848, there happened to be a cottage there. And there's a blacksmith, I think he was, named John Fox. And he and his wife, their two daughters, move into this cottage. And all the neighbors say, John, uh, don't move in there. It's haunted. And uh, lo and behold, they move in anyway. And they start to hear some knocking sounds in the house. Um, and I hear that these knocking sounds were, were mysterious. They were very regular whenever uh, darkness fell, and by the end of the month, it was driving everybody crazy. And they, they called in many of the neighbors who, uh, who witnessed this phenomenon. But towards the end of the month, the two daughters, I think they were 8 and 12, perhaps. You can correct me on that in a few, in a few seconds. The two daughters noticed that these knocking sounds would communicate with people, that you could knock, and the house would knock back, and you could knock again. And, and they started to give these knocking sounds a code. And I think the code was one knock for yes, two for no. They figured out an alphabetical code. And pretty soon, the girls um, were sent to Rochester to stay with the older sister. The knocking sounds followed them. And then the great circus showman, P.T. Barnum, found out about the girls and wondered if these knocking sounds might not be marketable. Brought the girls to New York City, set up uh, music halls, uh, sold tickets, brought the girls in. And the, the rapping sounds um, repeated themselves. And they spoke to the audiences. And, um, I mean, a, a star was born. Uh, Ron, would you say that this is a relative, uh, relatively shorthand version of the, the uh, first six months of spiritualism? That's, that's the short version. <laughs> Do you have anything to add? Uh... First, first they went to Corinthian Hall in Rochester. Oh, yes. It was Leia and and Maggie, and that's where that's where they first demonstrated the knocks. Oh. And after that, that's that's where P.T. Barnum heard about about it. Uh -huh. Do you know how old they were uh, when the they were nine and eleven? Nine and eleven. Okay, I won't forget that. Very cool. So they went to New York City under the auspices of perhaps P.T. Barnum. And um, a way, and first of all, they, they traveled the, the world, didn't they, the Fox sisters? Uh, mostly, mostly when they were younger, it was the United States. When, uh, I think when Kate was older, she, she went to England and she married a man over there. But I never heard of them going, going around the world. That was the, the Davenport brothers. Okay. Well, it's fairly safe to say, Ron, that if you never heard of it, they didn't do it. Now, um, you know of the, uh, the interview that the Fox sisters had. I, I believe the year might have been 1849 and then 1850. They were studied by professors at the Young University of Buffalo, in Buffalo, and I know they were also studied by, I think, four professors from Harvard University, perhaps when they were in Boston. Do you uh, remember the results of either of these examinations? I never heard of that. Okay. Well, let me refresh you. Um, 
both of the teams of professors would have been highly, how shall I put it, they were probably kind of prejudiced against um, spiritualistic phenomena. And I do remember the results of the Harvard crew. Um, among the four professors studying the Fox sisters in, in Boston was the great geologist Louis Agassiz. I mean, Agassiz is, is remembered as one of the great minds of his century. And of all the four professors, Louis Agassiz was the only one, I mean, the genius, he was the only one who said, you know, could be something really interesting going on here. I'm not quite sure what it is. But the consensus of most of the people who professionally examined the Fox sisters sounds a little uh, biased because one of the guys goes, well, they had to be cracking their toe joints because uh, that was the only way they could have been doing it. Ron, um, can you tell me anything about the the Hydesville Cottage? Because I know that for the next 50 years on or off, that cottage up in Hydesville was, was studied. And I know there might have been some traces found of the presence who had announced himself with uh, the knocking sound. I mean, the knockings were created by a, a being or whatever you want to call it that identified itself as a traveling salesman who had been killed and buried in the basement of the house. Do you remember anything about that, Ron? Yeah, and uh, in 1904, there were children playing in the, in the house in the basement, it was a rundown building at the time when it was uh, the property was all grown in with trees and bushes and all. Well, these kids were playing in the basement, and one of the walls fell in, and a skeleton came out. Oh my! That that really that really scared them, and in the in the excerpt from the Boston Journal in November of that year. They explained the whole story of the uh, the knockings and all, and they call it the spook house. And they and this it proved that when this skeleton came out, when fell out when in the wall, it would mixed with the dirt behind. There was a false wall built in the basement when the, the powder was killed. There's a Mister Bell. That's that's who they figured out killed the peddler. They. He started building another wall in front of one of the walls in the basement, and he built it up far enough, put the, put the body back there, and he kept on building up the wall till he would come up to the rafters, and it looked like just part of the cellar. They never knew that was a double wall. Well, the uh... so that proved that there were knockings in the house, and and they weren't pretending about it. Well, it 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 proves that. There could have been confirmation to the story of the uh, of the murdered salesman. I mean, somebody's body was buried down there. We can't say for sure who he was. And I heard the story that um, quicklime had been used to try to decompose the body too, so that the bone fragments found would be fairly uh, fairly uh, diminished. So it would be pretty hard to tell anything. But um, I think the the spirit who's or whatever was doing the knocking communicated that um, his murderer would never be punished, and I I do understand that uh, Mr. Bell did manage to go the rest of his life under a bit of a cloud, but he was certainly never accused of a murder. Well, this period in the middle 1800s would have to have been considered the heyday of the traveling performance mediums. Am I using the right word, um, Ron, by saying performance medium to mean a, a, a person who would be expected to display physical effects? Um, uh, that, that wording would, would be all right, because they did... People that uh, that would see them would have to. They would buy a ticket to go into wherever they were uh, performing at, and they would they would wait for something to happen. So I guess it would, you could call it a performance. Sure. Well, I, in my understanding, that was p 
possibly what you call somebody. I mean, we, we have a lot of mediums today, but when you go to to see them, you're not expecting um, knocking sounds or trumpets floating in the air. You're you're sort of expecting them to talk to you. And and um, um, so I, I thought maybe the term performance medium, I, I may be wrong there, but I thought that was pretty much what we called somebody who would give a physical demonstration. But, you know, this was the heyday right. of a great many people who are still famous. And bear in mind, Ron, I'm a, a skeptical person, but what that means is it, it doesn't mean I don't believe in psychic phenomena. It means I don't have my mind made up about individual cases ahead of time. I, I would have to tell you that I do believe personally that psychic phenomena can happen. And I, I say that because I, I b believe in my own mind that I've seen, I've seen it in my life. But um, some very interesting characters got started about the time of the, uh, the Fox sisters. Um, they, they almost might be interpreted as, as the crest of a wave that was just, just about ready to break over the world anyway. Um, there were two sons of a Buffalo policeman called the Brothers Davenport who got their start in the mid-1800s, a short while after the Fox Sisters' 1848 wrappings. Can you tell, tell me anything about the Davenport brothers? Anything st Did they have any connection with Lilydale, to your knowledge? Uh, not, Lilydale wasn't, wasn't incorporated here until 1879. The Davenport brothers started much, much before that. They were, they were the first actual mediums that, that traveled the world, and they, and they used a cabinet, and, and different noises would happen. Uh, they were tied together. The ropes would be untied. Uh, they were, they were pretty much. Uh, William died in 1877. That's that's two years before Lilydale started. He died in Australia. I was in Lilydale in the in the just before 1900. Okay. Now Ira. But he lived very to Lilydale. Ira Davenport lived in Mayville most of his life, I think. After his brother died, didn't he come back to Mayville? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah, I just met some of the relatives and, and went to the cemetery with them, where I, uh, I was buried. I've been to that cemetery. I I tried to find them once. I I they I, I thought I had it all nailed, and finally I asked for asked for directions, and I got to see his grave. You know, there's a a house in Lilydale. I'm uh, so, sorry. There's a house in Mayville that used to be a pub, and um, I think it's been a long time pub. And uh, I think the last name of it was Fiddlers, or it was it was a kind of a. Uh, that's wrong. Fiddlers. The, the Iris House was in front of the police where the police station is now, and they took the house down in two thousand five. Oh no! The, the pub behind the jailhouse there that was that was an Iris house. Oh, okay. Well, they, they all, the people that owned the place always thought it was. They thought that was Ira's house, or else that he went there. I don't know. They had some story about it, and they always, they were haunted, they felt, and they always blamed it on, on Ira. You know, when you, when you read the uh, accounts of the act of the Davenport brothers, it, it's really hard to believe that, that they were faking the whole thing. I mean, th these two guys were put inside a cabinet. I think they... They called it their spirit cabinet or something like that. And there were a bunch of musical instruments put in there, like drums and violins and all kinds of stuff. And there's two guys in there with four, pair, four hands, and ten instruments would start playing. I mean, they're, even if they're invisible, you know, they're hidden, hidden in their, their closet, it's pretty hard to see how this could have been done. And then people added the complication of tying the guys up and... Um, the, the guys would be found not only untied, and they'd open the door, and the guys were miraculously freed, but the craziest part of all is that you could, for the coup de grace of the performance, they would close the door, put the guys back in there, and all of a sudden they'd be tied up again, that, that whatever force untied them would, could tie them back up. It just sounds like a crazy phenomenon. Um, someone else that's interesting from the period is a, uh, an African-American mystic named Pascal Beverly Randolph. He died in 
He was probably a Rosicrucian. He was an occultist. And he was one of the uh, professional mediums who got started. I think he, he may have gotten started in Auburn around 1850. And he was quite a character. He would have been a rock star today. But do you uh, rem remember anything about Pascal Beverly Randolph? I can't remember anything about Randolph. I, I, re I remember somebody mentioning him, but I don't have any information here to, uh, at the house about him. Sure. That, well, that's fine. I don't think he, I don't think Randolph had a direct, much of a direct connection with Lilydale, but he was the direct. Uh, he was the the first biographer, I believe, of the Davenport brothers, and he may have come to Buffalo to uh, research those guys. Okay. Well, you know, Ron, there's there's a figure that I think probably will be familiar to you. If I said the name Andrew Jackson Davis, would you uh, have any reaction or comment? Oh yeah. I guess Andrew that's a Jackson yes. Davis was uh, he he actually spoke here in uh, in Leona, but he, all the books he 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 wrote and, and accomplished, and we even have our Lyceum named after him. Well, that's now. What exactly did uh, did Andrew Jackson Davis do? I know he started out as a very young man. He was a uh, a savant, I believe, who just started out with this. But but what what was his main claim to fame? He he started out writing more or less the uh, philosophies of spiritualism and and contacting spirits and, and unknown information. Uh, he was he'd get a lot of his information by by channeling. Okay, um, was he a healer too? Oh yeah, he was a healer, and he also had, he also had a medical degree later on in life. Interesting, Ron. Um, can you tell me what a channeler is for the benefit of uh, all of our listeners? It's when uh, you can go into a uh, you go into a trance state, and you receive information from an unknown being. In the spirit world. Okay. Is that different from being a regular uh, medium? Yes. A medium a medium will, will contact the deceased, and they could give you a, a message from that person, whereas someone who channels is just channeling information per se, not for any particular one person. And most of the time, they're channeling information to either write a book or, or or something like that. Sure, it's a much longer process. Now, Jackson Davis was very influential. He had uh, he had a pretty long career, didn't he? Yeah, he's he went from eighteen. He was born eighteen forty one, and uh, oh, I'm sorry. Now he, I think he passed away in nineteen in nineteen oh nine or nineteen eleven. Sure, he was he was in his high eighties. Yeah, yeah, I knew he was regarded in some quarters as one of the fathers of the the movement. You know, there's another um, Southern Tier connection to uh, spiritualist and spiritualist movements. Uh, the Reverend John Murray Spear and that uh, community called Harmonia. Um, do you know uh, anything about him and, and that area and its relationship to spiritualism? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was kind. We call it Kyan Town. Yes, it was down here, uh, Randolph, down, down just below Jamestown. But he had he had the idea of making a, a generator with. Uh, they were building stone towers, and they were using crystals, and they were using uh, different metals, and it, it was something like today's cell phone that you you could contact from Boston to New York, or New York even to out here, by just using the medium's mind. They would concentrate from one place, and a, a medium would be in in another place. It was like a human generator. And he was instrumental in that, and and also the roundhouse is down in Cayenne Town. He was 
it was a circular type of community. Yeah, you know, it, it really is interesting when you think of the way those folks were using stone architectural monuments. It makes you wonder sometimes what the, the ancient megalithic monuments of, uh, of Europe could have been used for. You know, were they also psychic communication batteries? Um, and he was way ahead of his. The people down there were way ahead of their time. I mean, what they were what they were making down there is what they're just discovering today, where you could you could send waves through the air and and communicate and and there's so many things that they were into. They were like within another seventy five or hundred years, they were. The scientists were, were just inventing what they were working on a hundred years before that. Well, I hear our, our haunting credits start to come in. I'm sorry you can't hear our nice music, Ron. But our break is pretty much commencing here. Take a few minutes off. But when we come back, Ron, I'm going to ask you a few more questions about related and potentially influenced um, religious movements. And I'm going to ask you a question about the Church of Mormon. So we'll see you in just a couple minutes, Ron, and, uh, and uh, uh, thank you so far. Podcast Yourself Network. Let's go check it out at gopodcastyourself.com. And we love you. Hi, everyone. Want to welcome you back to Twilight on the Western Door. This is Mason Winfield, your host of our program of interviews on subjects related to the spiritual, the supernatural, and the paranormal. Today's guest, and we're really happy to have him, is the historian of Lilydale, a gentleman named Ron Nagy. Ron, are you there with us? Yes, I am. Wonderful, because we've had a few connection problems, and I'm glad to, I'm glad to have you. You know, a little bit earlier today, Ron told me that um, since we're speaking to him from the spiritualist community of Lilydale, the energy down there uh, of all sorts is exceptionally powerful, and sometimes people do find that they have a few uh, a few issues with um, electric and uh, wireless devices when you're trying to patch through to Lilydale. But uh, so far, we've we've covered a bit of ground here concerning the early days of Lilydale. I did want to ask Ron while we're back in the eighteenth eighteen hundreds nineteenth century, Ron, can you Tell me about a few of the social issues. I know spiritualism had a connection to many of the the, the big issues of the day. Um, can you uh, tell us anything about that? Spiritualism was was involved in all the social causes, uh, uh, prison reform, abolition, temperance, uh, women's suffrage. They even got into the conditions of the economy and and the women and the home life. That right. Well, more well, or less called free thinkers. Well, I know um, an awful lot of the early mediums were women, and um, in a way, you know, spiritualism really did strike a blow for um, for equality in that respect because now women were being presented in on stage and positions of authority and uh so so that's that's very interesting. You know, I've heard a rumor, this is gonna be off the subject. It's it's something I didn't tell you that I might ask you, but I, I do want to know I just thought of it. I do want to know whether you know anything about this. I've heard a rumor, speaking of abolition, that a great many of the uh leaders of the Underground Railroad were people who may have had psychic ability. Um, did you ever hear that, that, um, you know, some of the, the, the conductors on this Underground Railroad could have been able to succeed as well as they did because they had some little bit extra abilities? 
Yeah, that's very possible. I, I never, I never thought of it that way. But they, they must have because they got so many people through without being caught. Yeah, I had heard a rumor that Harriet Tubman was thought to have perhaps some extrasensory abilities. Um, she had, she was a very brave individual, and in that she may have dodged disaster on a number of occasions. I'd also heard it possibly about Sojourner Truth. So interesting. Well. Um, can you tell us how, I've heard the phrase, the Leona spiritualists, and I don't know too much about that. Um, can you tell me about how Lilydale really got started as a, I mean, we, we've got the, the traveling Fox sisters and we've got a wave of imitators in the 1850s, but how do we end up with a, a religious community where people live in Casadega? Can you, can you bring me up to speed on that? Well, from from Leona, they had a big group there. They were very active. They had a lot of, lot of uh, big, big, uh, well-known speakers there. Uh, they wanted to have a picnic, and there was a, there was a place right outside of Lilydale here. It's it was a building that was like a, an inn, an overnight inn. It was the old house, and Willard Alden, the owner, he was one of the spiritists from Leona. So they decided to have one-day picnics down at the Olden Farm. And eventually that stretched into uh, 10 days. And then Willard Alden passed. When his son took, when, when his son took over after uh, his father died, he wanted to. T- he wanted a cut out of the, uh, the gate fee. In other words, he was they was t- taking a dime from everybody as an entrance fee to these picnics, and the spirit just decided that w- that they couldn't pay the expenses if he was to keep the the gate fee more or less. So uh, the group of spirits just got together, and they decided they wanted to buy. Land somewhere. They wanted their own. They wanted their own camp, and they wanted to incorporate under New York State laws. They started looking for for property, and they looked at uh, Chautauqua Lake. They looked at Lake Erie. They looked all over the place, but they decided they would. They wanted to stay right down here, across from where the old picnics were. This this was a Native American area. It was a passenger train across the lake, and there was a, there was a bridge to, to get there. And people were used to coming down to this area, so they bought 20 acres of ground adjacent to the Olden property. And uh, that's that's basically what they started. And they had a grand idea. They they just didn't want to have a picnic or a camp. They wanted to have a to make a village. That was exclusively for spiritualists, free thinkers, and liberals. Well, you're you're leaving and out within, the Republicans there, but keep going. <laughs> yeah, it was, that was that was 1879. In 1879, I found uh, an old, uh, more or less a blueprint or a map that was drawn. They already had streets and and the avenues and everything and the lots. There was a map already drawn out. They they hired a, a, a Mr. Cole from Arkwright. He was going. He surveyed the ground, but he must have had a work crew with him with a whole bunch of uh, lumberjacks, because they came in and they cut down all the trees on the east side of the hill in, in Lilydale. That's so they could drag the chains and and stake out the lots at 40 foot by 50 foot, 22 lots on a street. And within the first two years, they had 80 houses that were occupied here. So it wasn't just uh, uh, a spur-of-the-moment thing. They had, they had everything planned in their heads ahead of time, and it was a real vision to, to start a, vill- a village that there basically wasn't any other one in the United States like the one we, they started here because it was only for spiritualists and free thinkers. Sure. Hey, while we're on the subject of the uh, development of Lilydale, I have heard that the territory of of, of Lilydale in Casadega um, 
may have been of significance to ancient Native American societies, that it might have been a religious area to them. Have you ever heard that? Oh, yeah. There, there were, there's, there's still mounds in the area here. Do you know how many? Uh, I have a map at the museum. There's, there's, there's burial mounds, there's ceremonial mounds. Uh, there was, I think I, I seen that w- there was eight, and there was one way back in, in the swamp that you can't get to anymore. But the uh, original Indians here were the, the Erie Indians, and they got into a battle with the Iroquois and were destroyed. And later on, the uh, Senecas moved into the area. And that's how the Casadega name started, because they called the lake Gus Dega, under the rocks. That is cool. Boy, so you... We called we that Casadega. I, I learned something. Every time I do one of these programs, I learn, I learn plenty. Um, so you would say that there still are a couple of these ancient monuments still standing um, at Casadega. Is that safe to say? Yes. Interesting. Because, you know, the, the anthropologists aren't telling everybody everything they know. Um, and, they tell uh, everybody what they know. We'd, we'd be mobbed down here with people walking through our woods with shovels. Yep, there'd be the pot hunters down there. And we, we, we call them pot hunters because they'll tear apart an ancient monument hoping to find something uh, valuable, which is a shame. Well, I, I can keep a secret, uh, Ron, and I'll, I won't ask you any further questions about the, the old monuments. But it, it does seem interesting, doesn't it, that uh, a physical site that's had the lineage that Casadega did would become the... The, uh, the community of uh, some of the most spiritually inspired people of a different culture. It almost makes you believe in the force of landscape, doesn't it? Yeah, it's the energy in, in the ground or in, in the area that the, uh, the Native Americans left here. Because they used to, they, I'm told they used to meet in this area here, and they never did a battle in actual in the actual Lilydale area and uh, the Leland Woods area. They used to just meet meet there, and that's where they made their peace. Yeah, that's that's sort of what, like what I had heard too. That it it might have been a kind of a a peace zone for the prehistoric uh, Native Americans of the Northeast and the. Great Lakes region. Now, Ron, you've got a gift. You have a, a sort of a talent you've come to specialize in, and it uh, involves little pieces of metal that many of us use at the dinner table. Can you tell me about that? Could you repeat that? You're getting all I hear, there. I Apparently, I'm lost in my analogies here. Wouldn't be the first time. I hear you have a, a specialty. There's a a sort of a trick you can do, and it involves uh, metal implements that we use at the dinner table. Oh, that's spoon bending. Well, I was figuring that myself. Can you tell us okay. a little bit about it? Oh, this, the, the spoon is just a, 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 an object, and it can be changed. Your mind can... can uh, when I teach my class, I say... It's mind over matter. If you could set your mind and get rid of all the, 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 the cares and worries that are in your mind and just blank your mind completely and put the energy into an inanimate object, that inanimate object will bend. And that's just proof what your mind can do when you really set, when you really set yourself to do that. Yeah, I've got some spoons around my house, and I like them the way they are. But when I hold them, I can't imagine. I, I know that there are debunkers who claim that um, a spoon bender will be able to produce enough heat with his two of his fingers to be able to make the metal pliable. And I don't. I, I just. I just don't believe that. I don't let, when I have a class, I do not let anybody pinch 
the metal. I I have them kind of dance their fingers up and down. That way the heat doesn't doesn't go into the the metal because it's not the body. It's not your body heat that bends those. It's the it's your energy, and there's a difference between energy and heat. Well, yeah, that's that's what I would have thought. Um, you know, this brings us to, we may be getting out of chronology here, but undoubtedly you've heard of the uh, contemporary Israeli, um, he, I guess he's a performance medium, whatever you'd call him, Uri Geller. And uh, word is that he may be a spoon bender. You know anything about him? I'm told he's a spoon bender. I don't know if he teaches any classes or not. I, I I know he has different techniques where he can use sleight of hand. So you have to be careful because Yuri Geller is a professional magician, whereas I'm just an everyday Joe Smo guy. <laughs> I don't know anything about magic. Well, if you've got some abilities that are supernatural, I think you might be more than just that. But I've read some studies of Uri Geller, and... I know that, like many of the great performance mediums of the earlier century, he's a little bit of a a wise guy. You know, he um, he uh, he's flamboyant. You know, and uh, he may be moody. And uh, this accounts for the fact that there will be people who show up to see him, and they they come away mad at him or disappointed, or they think he's a fake or something like that. I mean. A great performance medium ought to be able to have an off night. And the trouble with some of our great performance mediums of the past is that they would sort of fake it. You know, they they might have an off night, and, and they'd, they'd kind of fake it a little bit. And, and if you get caught faking it once, they think you, you just can't do it at all. But I had heard that they had done some tests of the objects that Uri Geller could, you know, the spoons or whatever it was that he could bend or, or, or break. And they did some specific metal tests, and they said, you know, we can't figure out how this object um, came apart. It wasn't, it wasn't broken by mechanical force. It, it's almost like there was something chemical, you know, that, that... Have you ever thought that there might be some immeasurable force involved in, uh, in bending the spoons? Yeah, with, I've I've heard where they have been, the bent the spoons. Now, if you force bend the spoon, they could test that bend, and they could actually actually measure a, a force in there, and and they know it was forced. Whereas if if you bend it with spirit power or with energy, it more or less melts that one section with the, with a spoon or say even a fork I've been some forks too any kind of any kind of metal they could measure that bend there and there's an actual change in a meteor uh, meteorology wow that's a it's a mouthful <laughs> there's an actual difference in testing that metal the the, the viscosity changes yes the metallurgy perhaps might have been the <laughs> Word we were yeah. looking for, and I'm glad it, it wasn't me who had to say it first. Um, I, wh- while we're still f- metaphorically in the mid-1900s, I've got to ask you, were you aware of any connection between the Church of Mormon and spiritualism? Because it sounds like Joseph Smith, the, uh, first of all, Palmyra and uh, Hydesville are only about 10 miles apart, I believe. In Palmyra, New York, where the Church of Mormon was founded, Joseph Smith was talking to crystals and angels and uh, mysterious books. Do you, do you think there's any connection there between Mormon and, and spiritualism? I never heard that there was. Okay, interesting. Um, I'm glad to I'm glad to find that out. Well, we need to talk about some of, some of the famous personalities that have had a connection with, with Lilydale, because we're getting down to about four minutes. I want to ask you about Albert Hubbard of East Aurora, the founder of the Roycroft. I know he gave a talk at Lilydale. Do you think he was a spiritualist? Uh, I don't know. What I read about him, he was here in 1903, 
and he he was he had a, a lecture here. He was here in 1903, and. One thing that was noted about him is he was walking through the streets and some, and they put this in the newspaper that you couldn't miss Albert Hubbard because he had flashy, mixed-matched, brightly colored clothing. <laughs> well, <laughs> and that really that really grabbed me because uh, I never I I never. Heard that, and to, to read that in the newspaper from 1900, it was like, wow. I know Albert Hubbard was fond of uh, flannel shirts. He was a very successful, well-to-do man who, in 1903, he would probably have been about uh, 49, or he would he would have been in his 40s. But he he was well launched with his Roycroft Enterprise. But he 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 uh, was was never accused of of his sartorial splendor. Um, so you guys don't have a tradition down there that Albert Hubbard might have been a spiritualist or involved in it? You ever heard anything? No, I, 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 I never heard that. In, mm, okay. All right. Interesting. Well, as we come a little closer to the present, um, I have to ask you about a, a, a famous, uh, reverend, and, uh, I believe he might have been a spiritualist minister named the Reverend Jack Kelly. Now he was from Buffalo, I think he might have been born around 1900. Do you, what do you know about Reverend Jack Kelly? He was a spiritualist. He was a spiritualist reverend. He started a spiritualist church in uh, in Buffalo, and he was a, a Louisville medium down here and a healer for for many years. Uh, actually, our healing temple was 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 built for him by uh, Louis Bosberg. You know, he was said to be um, famous in Buffalo for being able to drive a car down Main Street completely blindfolded. He was said, Reverend Jack Kelly, he was said to have such tremendous um, abilities as a reader that, that he, could really, he could really show them off. And he could drive the car blindfolded, allegedly better than most people could, uh, sighted. And finally, the cops pulled him over, not because he was having any accidents, but just because they said, "Look, you just can't keep doing this. You're giving, you're just creating too much of a sensation here." But, you're making everybody nervous. I think he did it just to irritate the cops. Ah, uh, well, um, I am informed though that there's a very famous Hollywood actress, the "Come Up and See Me Sometime" girl, Mae West who um, I guess Reverend Kelly was her sort of her guru uh, or her confidant. Am I right? Yeah, uh, Jack Kelly was her personal medium, and they were also good friends. He was out in California a lot. Uh, Because she she wouldn't get a reading from anybody else besides uh, Jack. She didn't really believe in it right away. Uh, what I'm told is Jack Kelly gave a reading. He was doing a platform demonstration in California, and Jack gave a reading for one of Mae West's assistants. And they were so impressed they told Mae West about it. So she she actually went and witnessed what uh, Kelly could do, and then she had someone invite him over to her place for a private reading, and then after that, they became good friends, and that's that's the only medium she would uh, contact. Do you think um, Mae West was ever at Lilydale? Oh, yeah, she was at Lilydale in uh, 1954, and I think 1955, when they dedicated the uh, healing temple. I, I, have, I have a picture over here. That's, wow, that's, that's very cool. Well, as we're Getting a little. Cl- oh, first of all, can I ask you? Do you know how to track Reverend Kelly in in Buffalo? Because um, you know John Kelly is a pretty common name. I'm not even sure he was Irish. I think he. I think his dad might have been Welsh. But do you, by any miracle, recall the name of his church, or you have any leads in tracking it down? It was called the Church of Life. Okay, probably would have been active nineteen. 19- Forties. Uh, yeah, forties, fifties, sixties. 
Okay, we'll track them down. I'm going to bring up a famous name here in, I mean, a guy who was a wonderful comic and uh, a Saturday Night Live cast member. You must know that I'm speaking about Dan Aykroyd. Oh, yeah, Dan. One of the original Ghostbusters. Now, there is a rumor out there that Dan Aykroyd has a strong interest in supernatural, spiritual, and paranormal subjects. Do you know anything about that? Dan, Dan Aykroyd is a spiritualist. Is that right? Um, Dan's father, Peter, was here in 2005, and he was writing a book about, about ghosts and, and spirit phenomena. Uh, Dan's father, Peter, his Peter's grandfather, he was here in 1909. That was Samuel Ackeroid. He was a dentist, but they were also spiritualists, and they held seances every week for 30 years. Now, they're from Canada. But he came down, he came down here and, and did some investigating. But I spent a whole day with uh, Dan's father, and uh, he... he uh, Put a bunch of Lilydale stuff in his book that he that he put out, and Dan did the uh, introduction. It's called The History of Ghosts. That is fantastic. Ex excellent book. Well, I'd like to look that up. Um, I was thinking about There's writing. There's pictures of Lilydale's uh, spirit paintings in there, and and Dan's uh, some of Dan's family, and well, that, uh, that was one of the most enjoyable things I had down here, sitting sitting down and talking to uh, Peter for all day about spiritualism. I learned so much. I'm going to track that book down, especially because I had thought about writing something like that myself. Um, and uh, because I think there's a lot of... There's a, there's a line out there between parapsychology and, and religion that, you know, there's a line between the two, and that's... Um, and parapsychology is probably the middle ground between outright disbelief and outright religious faith. The middle ground is parapsychology, and I've been waiting for a book that would address that perspective. I will track this one down. I can't wait to. Um, it's a history of ghosts. Um, Peter Ackroyd. It's uh, Rodale is the publisher. It was 2009. That is. I like it because Lilydale's in it. Some of our pictures in it. He, uh, he he put in there a couple of my quotes about the spirit paintings. Was uh, he was really interested in the precipitated spirit paintings? That's basically what he was down here for. Well, now, you had a couple of uh, famous, um, and I guess a precipitated spirit painting. Can you tell us what that is? Precipitated spirit painting is a painting or a work of art that just appeared on canvas without the touch of a human hand. This this happened between, I'd say, 1894 and 1914. And they have been investigated, and, and an iridologist look into the eyes, and they say there's no way anybody could paint something like that. And I said, well, nobody did paint them. They just appeared. <laughs> Well, you wrote a book about those. Well, you've got um, you, you've got the, a legacy of some pretty famous um, precipitated spirit painters down there. I mean, there was a a, a team of uh, team of guys. I think they they went by the name of the Brothers something. Uh, Campbell the, Brothers. The, yeah, that's right. Yes, and, and then they had the Bang Sisters. <laughs> the Bang Sisters. That's an unfortunate... B-A-N-G-S, Bangs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. unfortunate uh, name for them, you know. I think there's a... Uh, but, um, so that was their forte. And... Yeah, that, was, that were the only, only two couples that I think ever could do that. But I found some other ones that were trying to do it, but I've I, I seen too much uh, cheating. Yeah. Ron, um... I think we're nearing our conclusion here, and I'm going to be uh, joining you guys down at Lilydale. I'll be giving a little talk in July, and I'll look forward to seeing you then. But have you got some classes coming up or anything you'd like to uh, 
inform us about uh, in, a, in a minute or two? I have we have a remaining? snow bending class on the 20th of uh, August this year, uh, 7 to 9 at night, Assembly Hall. Okay. What I say is, is if you come to my class and you don't bend the spoon, you don't go home. <laughs> well, that I thought you'd like like buy me a steak dinner or something. If I, I mean, my, my feelings could be be hurt, Ron. I don't want to get the, stuck there in a a prison. I mean, you, I, I, I try and come up with a little more positive way of saying things. Like if you come to my class and don't, I get about everybody to bend the spoon. Well, but the ones you don't get to bend a spoon, I'm thinking they may still be stuck there in a state of limbo. Well, then I have what I have them do is I have them stop by the museum the next day and I give them a private lesson. Oh, okay. All right. Well, now that's sounding. Uh, I'll leave until you bend the spoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's sounding a, a a good bit a good bit more positive, uh, Ron. I'm I'm very happy to hear that. Well, I I hear our very mysterious and entrancing closing credits fading in, for which we thank once again the Afro Celt Sound System, a Scottish African fusion band that we admire so much. Their music sounds like what we mean: mood merging and mysticism. We thank them for their work, as we thank Chris Starr, Carolyn Smith, and the whole GPY Radio, that's Go Podcast Yourself Network. We thank our engineers and support staff, Dale Smith and devilish DJ Scott. Most of all, we thank our esteemed guest, Ron Nagy. You can contact Ron for speaking events or classes, either through the Lilydale Assembly in Casadega or through our website and Facebook page, Twilight on the Western Door. Otherwise, until we meet again in the twilight, shine in that light whose smile kindles the universe. Work every day to make this a better world. Let's go check it out at gopodcastyourself.com. And we love you.